Welcome to Opera Holland Park, just in the process of setting up for their annual summer season. And we're delighted to say we're going to be here with a special word in your park on June the 18th to celebrate the 80th birthday of James Paul McCartney in the company of Danny Baker, Julia Rayside, Andy Miller, Jeff Lloyd and Graham Goldman in this fabulous arena which has the combination of a roof that keeps the rain off but sides that allow the sunlight and the air in. If you came last year, you won't need reminding. If you didn't come last year, make sure you come this year. Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Word in Your Ear. Now, I remember buying this record in 1979 when it came out, being astonished about various aspects of the cover. One is that Elvis Costello wasn't on it. This is Armed Forces. And two, as you may remember, if you turned it round, it unfolded into a series, a great explosion of pop art panels. And I can remember thinking that was fantastically unorthodox and challenging at the time and brave and brilliant. And I felt the same about this, which came out three or four years later. This is Life's a Riot by uh, Billy Bragg. This was the time of Culture Club, the time of Spandau Ballet, the time of uh, Duran Duran. And here was this amazingly bold, no picture of the artist again on the cover, amazingly bold graphic art statement. And I discovered that both of those were the work of a brilliant graphic designer called Barney Bubbles and his life and his work and lots of a couple of pictures of his, his artwork and his ephemera uh, are contained in this revised edition of a brilliant book called The Wild World of Barney Bubbles by Paul Gorman. Paul, welcome. Very nice to see you. Now, the books about design before you wrote a brilliant book about the face not long ago. So, so you've obviously always been aware of, of, of graphic design. Um, when did you first become aware of, of, of Barney and his work? Um, I suppose it was in the early 70s when I was um, a teenager and friends of mine liked Hawkwin. I liked them and I liked the records, but you'll remember that, you know, uh, money was quite tight. The records were quite expensive. Yeah. And so I had to pick, pick my choices. But I did. I suppose I've always been visually aware. And so I was plumping for the Alice Cooper albums, which were always amazing looking, you know, yeah. Billion Dollar Babies, yeah. Killer. There was a whole series of them. And Rod Stewart as well. They were really, really extra visual extravaganzas as well as the music, which I love. But um, I went to see Hawkwind a couple of times, notably in 1975 at the Roundhouse. Um, and I'll show the poster later. But his... his He's, he received credits at that point. In that first half of his career, he was receiving the credit as Barney Bubbles. That's not his real mm -hmm. name. His real name was Colin Fulcher. Um, but uh, and so I was aware that he was the person who provided the visuals. And then the poster that he made for that gig, just that one gig, you know, that one afternoon, yeah. it's just a really superb piece of work. And I remember that having you know at the time a deep impact on me that somebody would come up with such work for such an ephemeral item and then cut to a couple of years later i was buying the early stiff singles actually six months in the stiff singles that uh, were designed by him mainly without credit and there was a wonderful bloke called eugene manzi you guys yeah know. we did um sadly passed but uh, he ran the record shop manzi's in swiss cottage and he obviously knew of Barney and came from that world. And so he told me that these designs, Elvis Costello, Reckless Eric, Larry Wallace, that run of stiff designs, which were all the dams, were all of incredible quality, those sleeves, came from this person who'd been designing for this hippie but give space. Us some, give us some idea of where he came from and how he got into that, because he was from West London, I think, wasn't he? And then he got into C C Conran, was it? He? he was working for Conran? Yes, exactly. I mean, he came from a very, very normal background, which is why sometimes you see he was kind of obsessed with the quotidian. You know, the everyday appears in his work quite often. Um, and uh, so he was born in Witten in Middlesex during the war in 1942. He was born Colin Fulcher. Um, he was quite a brilliant young student and he spent five years at Twickenham Tech, the art school there, where he studied various um, uh, disciplines. Uh, and I have some of his student sketchbooks and he was a very accomplished draftsman. Um, but he majored in 
cardboard display for retail. <laughs> you can like. major in that, can you? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, an MA in cardboard you display. See, I, I think this is, you know, this, this, that, that kind of stalks this entire conversation because he made his name doing what we might call packaged goods. Yeah. They yes. may have been records, but they were packaged goods. And so a lot and of the skills that came that applied to packaging cocoa probably applied to this as well. I want to ask you just a yeah. supplementary there. He did five years at the tech. That's a yeah. long time. So it he is, really but... was taken through everything, was he? Yes, yes, he was. You know, life classes, um, uh, the various different things that you, you could experience at that wonderful time when people with enthusiasm rather than qualifications could yeah. get really, really decent art education and yeah. practical application of it um, free on the government, you know, for, as part of the welfare state. And so he really benefited from being in the right time at the right place. Uh, he left there um, and designed a, a poster for the college band, the Mule Skinners. Ian McLagan was in the Mule Skinners and went to college. He was in the year beneath uh, Colin Fulcher at that time. That won a British poster award. Have you got that there? I haven't got it here, no, actually. No. But it's in the book. Yeah. Um, so um, this then kind of added to his reputation, and he got a job at a typography studio, Michael Tucker and Associates, where um, I spoke to one of his colleagues who said that this was the kind of place where you had to wear button-down shirts, and you know it was kind of very Ivy League and very strict, and any and wasn't an ampersand; it was a cross. So Michael Tucker and Associates, the and is across. So it was that kind of place, very Swiss, very, very uh, hard, hard edge graphics. And then he was recruited by Terence Comron's design studio to, as you say, design everything from the Bulmers, uh, Strongbow, Archer, Norman oh, Archer. That's right. To seed packaging, to retail displays, to uh, work for this very posh grocery business at the time, Justin de Blanc, which was in Knightsbridge. And Justin... Uh, uh, is no longer with us, but he told me that, you know, he really got on with Barney. I mean, he was quite well-born, Justin, but Barney was just this brilliant guy who could apply his skills to anything. And uh, as Dave was saying, it, that, it was like Peter Blake, really. They both trained in commercial art, didn't they? Absolutely. So, and when he got into sleeves, it wasn't just kind of abstract uh, impressionism. This was, it was, it, you could be really outrageous and, and eye-catching, but your job was to sell, wasn't it? Yeah, and to engage the consumer. And this is why the uh, sleeves, posters, whatever, continue to, you know, bewitch, really, because they're very, very engaging. And so the armed forces packaging, I mean, he was very, also very lucky in having a sympathetic client in Jake Riviera, who was prepared to shake things up in that same way that Bubbles was because having got the idea to use the that the the artwork of the elephant. What what's that? I think it was Jake's idea, wasn't it, to use that? To, it was, yeah. Well, it was he and Bobby. They 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 kind of commingled their ideas, so one never really knows. Jake came up with the sloganeering. We're sure of that, but Barney was pretty adept with the phrase as well. Originally, they wanted a black velvet painting. They wanted something incredibly kitsch and suburban. And so this was painted, they commissioned uh, an artist, uh, Tom Pogson, to come up with a parody, a pastiche rather, of the uh, nature, natural wildlife uh, painter, David Shepherd. And so a lot of David Shepherd's depictions were in suburban drawing rooms. And the idea was that this looked quite boring from the front. And then on the back, it kind of explodes. Right, right. That's brilliant. What, do, what, do, what examples have you got there of his early work to sh show us, give us an idea of his kind of well, this progress is, um, and his range? This, right. this little thing is a ticket for a gig by the Mule Skinners for the um, uh, Twickenham Text school, uh, Christmas Dance on Eel Pie Island. And it's in Russian script. Is, is that Cyrillic? I'm not sure. That so what, says, what, year, what year were we talking about with that? 1963. Really? Uh, and so he would have been 21, and this was his for his local R&B band. Uh, and it says in, in Russian, the translation is Christmas dance. But it's not... <laughs> it's not in normal. Russian. I just love the way I love the way he did that, and everyone went, great! <laughs> Nobody yeah, right. said there is a possibility that might not be understood, you know. 
but it says come Cossack. Oh, right. right. That's to the brilliant. Dark. So, so this is not your usual R and B band ticket. You know, the Prissy Things or even the Rolling Stones weren't producing things like no, that. They, no, 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 no. So, how do you get hold of a thing like that? How does that? How does well, a thing like was, that end up in your possession? I was very lucky that um, the people close to him. He he didn't care about his stuff, and he, in that way that those people did, he just walked away from all of his work. Really, he didn't keep very much at all. Really. Um, and after the first edition came out in 2008, I was contacted by his ex-girlfriend, who remained his friend for the rest of his life, uh, Laurie Sartoria, again, sadly gone. Uh, and she had kept hold of this stuff, really waiting mean. for somebody to... Oh, just wanted and, somebody to want Oh, to. that's so perfect. It was oh, really well, beautiful. Very touching. Very, she was a very beautiful person, and um, she um, had gone out of contact. She was kind of not living off the grid. She was living in Swiss Cottage, actually. But <laughs> she, she was no longer in contact with anybody who had any association with him. And so a lot of people thought that she'd also died. Oh, yeah. And um, so it was really great. She gave me quite a few of these things which were very precious to her, which she felt should be out there. In oh, the absolutely. Book. Quite right. Yeah. So uh, what, what else you got there? So this is from her also. This is his first record sleeve design which was for a self-recording made at Waterloo Station. It's his Christmas me message to his family and friends. And I think maybe only 50 were made, maybe less, actually. And uh, he's written, you see, it's uh, Calibre Auto Recordings. Um, I love her very much, he's written in the middle. But it's an amazing design. This is 1965. It is. That's extraordinary. 65. That's amazing. So he gave to that trouble for something just, just for something his just for a few mates for Christmas. Yeah, and his family, effectively yeah. a Christmas card, isn't it? Yeah, and so he was full of that kind of generosity of spirit, which is one of the things that you know sadly was his undoing because you know he was quite a fragile character at the same time. Yeah. And she also gave me these, which are really really precious. He was commissioned by Fleetway Publications to come up with uh, a Mods and Rockers album or annual or something, or some project. I've never been quite sure what it was. And so she gave me these two watercolours. I think this is George Harrison, but actually yeah. looking at it, it's a bit like Keith Richard. Could be, it could be Keith Richard. Either. Yeah. There's some scrawl on there about the Beatles. So I think it's George Harrison. And then on the back, Electra sets, Rockers and Mods. Electra set. So it's really beautiful. And take you back. And as I say, he was a great draftsman. And then this is the companion, which is the rocker, which is a female rocker. I mistook her for Brian Jones originally. I but uh, Ray told me that, that you know, she, was, she was a girl. She was a friend yeah. of theirs who was a member of the 59 Club. All right. All so they're really exquisite, right. aren't they? So by now he was getting connected to the kind of what we would written by the late 60s called the rock underground, presumably. Yeah, and they and, uh, they used to have to pull all nighters at Conrad's studio, which yeah. was in Hampstead in the West End. And one night, he and a friend, John Muggeridge, a uh, relation of Malcolm, went for a walk, and they came across UFO, and so went in there and realised that you know there were fellow like-minded souls. Um, and he started doing these bubble light shows, you know, dropping oil on water, oil on paint. Right and projecting them against uh, bands and films. And so that's how the name came about. He was always nicknamed Barney, and so he became Barney Bubbles, and the Barney Bubbles night show came into oh. being. And he also started to ingest LSD in quite huge quantities. Um, and so he threw himself from this very straight commercial world into the underground. He took a trip to, literally, to uh, the West Coast, lived in Haight-Ashbury for a while. It's only about six weeks, but then went to LA. Um, but just before that, he'd formed this kind of little cabal of artists, the, these three flatmates who lived together. He and his two flatmates staged these happenings, early happenings, and they called themselves the A1 Good Guys. So it's very 66, actually. This is just pre-UFO, maybe about the same time. And so they invited various people to come along and make uh, things out of paper or maybe take part in films or just creative outpourings. Um, and so that's got that thing where it's incredibly 
the logo is incredibly commercial in a way. And it's yeah. kind of corny as yeah. well. He wasn't scared of a, a corny quotes or pun. Um, and that lasted throughout his work. Having returned from LA uh, and the West Coast, he kind of got into that sort of pop culture, you know, the culture of hamburgers and neon. And so he launched this company, Team Burger Designs, on his own at 307 Portobello Road in 1969. And this was the livery, this was the letterhead, which is basically a burger napkin with a burger on it, which is actually a printer I was talking to. We did some T-shirts of this a couple of years ago. He reckons that that's made up of letter set. That's not, you know, it's not a depiction of a burger. It's made up of other elements. And so um, Team well, Burger... Pre-computers, it was such a complicated... Just, it was that's it. the thing. It was the thing so about all these no things. Analog. There were so few people who, who had... They were, they were, you know, hand skills, weren't they? These yeah, things. they really were. To be able to oh, do yeah. anything like that, you couldn't find anybody who could do something like that. They were a exactly. rare breed. And so Jonathan Green told me that he basically became... Uh, an ancillary industry of the underground. You know, you wanted something printed, you wanted something designed. He knew, to... he knew the practicalities as well as everything else. And yes. The practicalities exactly. were the really difficult bit. Which is know. why so much of the underground press is so terrible looking, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Didn't he try to work for Oz at one point? Talking he about did. The press. Well, he, he, produced did. An, he produced an edition of Oz and was a bit unhappy about it. It was a bit of a bruising experience because Felix Dennis was on the ride and quite rightly said, well, we've got to have some advertising in this thing. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> destroyed one of his posters. It was, a, it was made up of two fold-out posters and other elements. And they replaced one of his posters with these rather cheesy ads. And so he was very upset about that and never worked. <laughs> That's a little precious and idealistic, so, isn't it? <laughs> well, when, when his kind of break, his breakthrough client were presumably Hawkwind, were they? Oh yes, oh yeah, they were. Um, but they were like-minded individuals, and so um, they met through Friends magazine, which actually, if you look at it, it's it's my favourite of the underground papers. Mm -hmm. It's really well designed. I think yeah. Piers Mark Bank was there. It's for readable, a while. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's and it's a recognizable newspaper yeah and yeah. so because the whole Ladbrook Grove scene was coalescing around Mick Farron and Lemmy and those people um and so they met at friends offices and he became I think optics optics is him and semantics was Robert Calvert who was a a, a, a oh, part right. yeah. Brian, really. yeah. so he came up with the verbals and Barney Bubbles came up with the visuals and so the Hawkwind albums from the second album the first one's kind of an average. He wasn't involved in it. From the second album, which folds out into a hawk, to uh, the fourth album, Space Ritual. And so I'm not sure I'm going to get this in the screen, but that's the front, yeah. which is kind of Art Nouveau on yeah. acid. And then it folds out. It's a double album, but it folds out. In four ways to the It's that. Hey, yes, 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 yes. Okay. And so, and there's so much going on in it. I can't show you here, but it's the you know, perfect thing. It was when 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 records were kind of like a movie for your ears, weren't they? You know, it was that idea that you would sit there and spend the whole evening just listening to that record and studying that sleeve. Well, one did, you know. And so there's yeah. the there's the inner, which is you know, I imagine you know quite dazzling if you've taken a few tokes. And I think that was the idea as well. He wanted to turn people on with yeah. visuals as much as he saw the world in a very exciting way i think and sometimes overpowering way and yeah. um, you get that through his work it's very it's kind of almost you know not threatening but there, there's something about it which is quite dangerous i think sometimes yes yes it's kind of out of control isn't it really yeah certainly <laughs> well talk, talking about of control and this is breaking the, con the continuum but he'd appreciate that oh, go on. Uh, this is the single sleeve for accidents will happen by Elvis Costello and the attractions, and it's inverted. And so the design the single, is on the inside. Do you know, and I had never what, seen that until I read about that in your no, book. No, I don't think I had seen it. It's extraordinary. And so the only clue when you got the record is this very tiny type at the top announcing the title. But the front... It's just an anonymous single. And so that's really out of control. But again, he's got Jake Riviera chiving him along and they're probably yeah, coming yeah, sure. up with an idea about how they play with the process. 
Well, it, it also really suited Stiff, didn't it? I mean, this is not a Stiff record, but obviously, the, the you know the the color yeah. color bar on the side of yeah. this, you know, which people thought was a mistake and so forth, and clearly it wasn't. And it the Stiff relationship written really suited him because and, and they were playing with the whole idea of a record company, weren't they? They were exactly pretending the to be Motown, but doing yeah. it in a really odd in, way. In, yeah, so, in the opposite. So they wanted somebody like him who who could just think of unusual twists on uh, what a record packaging was supposed to be. Yes, exactly, because you have the confidence and the skills to break through uh, with those ideas. But then, of course, they carried through to Radar Records, which this yeah, year, yeah. Yeah. and then on to F-Beat for many yeah. years with, you know, Nick Lowe and uh, Elvis Costello in particular. But so uh, these were always, I talked to Rat Scabies about the Downs album, the, you know, the cover where they're in the pie fight, they've obviously been yes. in the food fight. But he talks about the use, uh, Bonnie Bubbles' use of the, the title, Dam Dam Dam, in big yellow lettering. Yellow, really. He's, he's saying, that's going to sell the record. When you're going through the racks in the shop and you don't, you've never heard of the Dam, it's their first album, they've only been together about less than a year, that's going to make it pop. It's interesting. Yeah, but, that, but it's interesting that he followed that with music for pleasure. Which was totally the opposite, wasn't it? You went it past. Yeah. You went past music for pleasure. Thinking that can't be the new damned album. Yes, yes, exactly. And you know he's going to um, really riffle through the history of art and design, the recent history, and come up with the constructivists at a moment yeah. when their work really suited what was going on in punk and post-punk. Right, Do you right. think that he was in any way kind of controlled and restrained by Stiff? Because it's really interesting that, A, that they got him to do broadly most of their artists, B, that he gave Stiff such an extraordinary signature. It was that idea that it was commercial, but it was also sinister, actually, and quite challenging and quite aggressive, yeah. you know. Yeah. But do, do you think they just gave him free reign, or was there any time that he was told just to, you know, that they simply couldn't put out what he wanted to do? No, 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 I don't, I don't think so at all. Um, I, I can only think of one instance where an artist said that they didn't like stuff. Well, actually, there's a couple towards the end um, of his life. He took his own life at the age of uh, 41 in 1983. And there, his work becomes increasingly uh, restrictive and uh, it's very uh, graphic and also quite threatening as well. And so he designed uh, the cover of um, Punch the Clock for Elvis Costello and Costello turned it down because he's got a kind of electrocuted Elvis rendition. Oh, and so it's quite a frightening thing. And you're thinking, Elvis Costello is trying to break America. Yes. This is not the way he's going to do it. Yeah, there's a Johnny Moped sleeve in the book, um, which has got kind of, it's a pair of arms that have been kind of Bound in kind of bonded oh, yes. twine, uh, superimposed yeah. over Johnny Moped's face. And you think this is, it really couldn't be less commercial if you tried, really. But obviously, everyone thought, well, this creates an impression. It creates a, an image, doesn't it? It's, uh, and it, it? It's kind of in keeping with, I mean, Jake said about uh, Johnny Moped, he said Barney loved Johnny Moped because he was always, bring me your dented and bent out of shape. And so that suited Johnny Moped, didn't it? That imagery, is, yeah. it, in, it chimes with the music, which was kind of wacky that was being yeah. made. Yeah, it's amazing. Is, the, is that Barney Bubbles, that one? Yes, it is, yes. It is. I'm trying to, trying to see his name on the back. It says yes. cover concept, but uh, big jobs incorporated. I always assumed it was Barney Bubbles. I just can't see but his name, but you, it is. That's definitely him, and that was one of his pseudonyms, was Big Jobs, Inc. I oh, think okay. also for the Downs album, there was that. He had various pseudonyms, Heaps Willard, um, Sal Forlenza, um, Grove Park, and for the Get Happy album, he put his VAT number. Right. That's <laughs> incredible. It's the thing that strikes me about this, and I have to look at this, you know, because uh, yeah, Chilly Willie were a wonderful band. But we're never going to be popular ever, not in right. this or any other world to come. Right. But you look at the amount of love that went into this. You yeah. know what I mean? That is nothing's off the peg there with that, is it? You know, yeah. more yeah. illustrative uh, items on the back. 
there is huge well, amount of love going into that, isn't there? Ex exactly. And um, I think he felt a great affinity with them, not least Martin Stone, the late great yeah. Martin. Yeah. Um, but Peter Saville um, contributed an essay to the book, and I talked to him several times about Bubbles, and he said, one of the things about the work that strikes you as a designer is he never said that'll do. No. You know? No. And no. so you really get that, that the quality threshold is so high and he's working so hard that to maintain that, you know, you'd have to be really, uh, you know, excellent and also inexhaustible, which is one of the reasons why I think his life ran out because he'd done so much. You know, if you look at 1979 alone, you've got do it yourself in 24 or is it 20 wallpaper covers different got, colors. collective yes. it's a brilliant idea loads yeah. of international editions so you know for the completers who's way ahead of the time because the yes. completers had to go out and buy 24 copies of it exactly and um you've got uh, in the same time period you've got an album with a terrible title and not a bad album by the rumor called frogs clogs krauts and sprouts, sprouts and yeah, sprouts. yeah. Yes. but I've that's got it here pain around it um, and then Labour of Lust, this is in the same time frame, Armed Forces, and there are others as well. That would exhaust a designer if he took five years over them. Yeah. I think B Billy Bragg, I think, in the, in the book, makes a really good point about how he, he made unprepossessing blokes look cool. Yes, that he was did. a really good point, because actually you think about them, they're often quite, you know, it's, it's Elvis and it's the damned and it's Billy himself and it's people who are, they're not the kind of normal charismatic people you can simply put on the front of a, of, of a sleeve, you know, and it, and it works. Is this, I was going through my records this afternoon, is this one of his? It's a damned album. Yes, that's, that's, that's the second yeah. one. That's yeah. the that's, candy that's, candy. This is an extraordinary example. If you think this is the second album by the damned at the height of punk, you know, and that, that's the cover. And then on the inside, yeah. you know, you get this extraordinary kind of blurred abstract picture of them. And the picture on the back, they've all got extra noses or extra eyes kind of yeah. grafted in. You know? he, was, he, was really, he was really into photographic manipulation. But the interesting thing about the inside cover where there's, they're lined up, they're actually lying down. On oh, the yeah. And then he turned them up. I think on the cover of Get Happy, uh, Elvis Costello's, repeated i think three times he's actually lying down yeah so they turn, oh, yeah. there's always that thing there's a slightly jarring effect and he knew how to kind of tweak you as you looked at something yeah yeah and did it was he a big part problem, of the concept there problems with some of his records in the states when uh, the american record companies columbia didn't know whether to go along go on tell us about that well so I, it starts with this year's model um, and however strong an advocate Jake Riviera was, and he was a pretty fearsome advocate yeah, yeah. for his artists, uh, including Barney Bubbles, uh, they would not have this year's model without Elvis Costello's and the title's full name on the cover. And so they got rid of the Prince's quote, quote and pushed it back around to where it should have been. And then with Get Happy with the scuff marks deliberately put in there, they just got rid of them and reproduced it as it was, a new album rather than one that maybe had been in your racks for 20 years. So this tell, me, tell me about Get Happy. I didn't know about this until, until and you know, these jokes sometimes go over your head until 40 years later you read a book about it. What, what's the story with Get Happy and the scuff marks? Oh, uh, the idea was... Oh, I've got a copy of it. Here we are. All right. There you are. Oh, like, that, brilliant. of course. It's a scuff yeah, mark yeah. in the middle, isn't it? Yes, of course. So, because he, he often listened to the music. Well, I, I think his modus was to listen to the album and then work on it. You know, the, right. there's kind of yeah. uh, this uh, factory way of doing it. And so the story was, and I think it's true, Costello had been to Rock On, hadn't he? And, bought, and Bubbles was very friendly with that crowd because he worked for Chiswick Records. But Costello had come away with 60... 60s R&B and soul albums yeah. and so this was supposed to be that album that you pulled out from between this is soul and yeah, a sound yeah. thing or whatever and so it was it was reflective of the content wasn't it it looked like it sounded like old music but done in a new way and the pre-loved say <laughs> pre-loved yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh it's so, wonderful yeah, the subtitle of the book is uh, Graphic Design and the Art of Music. Yeah. You know, is it not the case that he, he worked in a period and he sadly died just as that period was coming to an end where graphic design had a, a forgive me, I'm going to use the word symbiotic 
relationship with music, which is never had since. Yeah. And probably never had before, you know, because and I don't think you, you've got to, you've got to dig into this. It's quite interesting, you know, that the, um, you know, you took your whole quint sleeves that you showed us that went out every which way and Elvis Costello arm forced that went out every which way. And this was the time of Pink Floyd and the thing where you pulled off the black, you know, vinyl thing on the outside. There were, you know, the, the, the marketing of the, of the records was the packaging of the records. It was the same thing. You know, that was the appeal of buying them. Yes. Was that you took them home and you peeled them apart and there were things inside. And, and that was immensely exciting, wasn't it? You know, and, that, but, and you yeah. can't do that in the world of CD. Simply can't do it. Well, it was too small a frame, but I think the marketing budgets went on videos with MTV launching. This is it. This well, is it. And so you've got the, the couple of things which, you know, put him out to, uh, to grass in a way is that, you know, uh, MTV starts to take off. Record companies are spending money on videos. He directed a few, directed the specials Ghost Town, for Christ's sake, you know, yeah, an yeah. ear-defining video if ever there was one. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. And so he tried his hand at that. But also the CD was really on the march, you know, and I, I know that you, you very much attached to it in a way that CD was going to be the new format of yeah. hell or high, no, or, or high water. And I think he felt restricted by that because suddenly his canvas was shrunk. Um, and it's and not just, it's not just, I think you're right, the canvas is shrunk, but it doesn't feel the same. A record, this... Yeah. Is a paper product. Yeah. And and a lot of the skill, same skills attached to designing a book or a magazine will apply to that. Yeah. A CD is not. It's, you know, the paper bit of it is stuck inside behind a little plastic window. With the hinge yeah. always breaking. The hinge the always hinge breaking. Breaking. But also it's very hard to think of any CD cover that's ever had anything like the impact of any of those i, I think Björk, and i can't remember who designed it. is it mark farrow but Björk produced a series of stunning cd covered you know they were produced for her or in yeah. concert. um but i think there's another point to be made about the the uh, you know the march of technologies that timing he was his timing was almost immaculate in a way he died he died six weeks before the introduction of the apple mac they so that all of those skills that he had, we had an exhibition at Chelsea Space at Chelsea College of Art a few years ago called Process, and it was just about his process work. It was pre-getting to the uh, shop shelves. Um, and there were young design students there who were just completely beguiled by this stuff that had been done by hand, including he did for Line Records, uh, an American, a German company, a grid. So he hand drew it with a, with a ruler, but it was just there as this very simple grid, which had been hand drawn, and you, you saw kids just staring at it for hours, you know. In one, well, it's, it's like it's like engineers wanting to make records, you know, in the old ways, because you can't imagine those skills, no. because they were they were the kind of things that took people years to get to be able it's, to, you know. It's also, I think, it was um, considered a bit of a degraded form as well before Peter Savile with New Order or uh, Malcolm Garrett or Neville Brody, It was considered, you know, whatever the greatness of the Rod Stewart and Alice Cooper albums that I had or yeah. Bob Mar Catch a Fire or any yeah, of the yeah. really great covers, it was kind of, yeah, well, that's, that's secondary. And quite often, if you look back on the reviews of, say, Armed Forces, the cover gets barely a mention. Yes, it's true. Yeah. They talk That's about true. people just expected these things to be kind of outrageous. That's in right. the, this whole, this whole really true. area, this whole area is the most classic example of you don't know what you've got till it's gone. It is gone. You know, yeah, exactly. nobody sat there in 1974 and go and went. Do you know we're living in the golden age of album packaging? Yeah, nobody I ever I said that. Holding these albums up and marveling at them, you know, never I, thought about it for a minute. But I think that it also ties into the potency of pop music it did start to die in the 80s. You know, you end up with Live Aid. You, you end up with not very vanguard ideas being channeled through pop music. And I think that in terms of visual culture, which is what I'm interested in, 
in terms of the fashion and the style, after that it becomes routine and you get stylists, you know, putting New York Dolls yeah. t-shirts on the court yeah. or stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not here to complain about that because I think that that's great design. But, you know, my last book was about Malcolm McLaren and he understood that for the Sex Pistols to resonate, they had to look fantastic and wear his clothes as well, which hopefully he would then sell with Vivian Westwood. Yeah. But yeah. that was gone by 1983, I think. Everything had become corporatized and formed. I mean, we, we think now, it's probably a hate, it, but we think about the world now and the way it is. But at the time, things started to feel very safe, didn't they, in 1983? Mm -hmm. I who think were the people who took on his, his, who were influenced by him then, and took on some of his right. ideas? Like Peter Savile is a really good example of factory, presumably. Yeah, and Peter Savile. Um, this is a badge. <laughs> I like badges, and I think Bubbles did as well. Um, this is the cover of uh, Generation X's first yeah, single, yeah, Your Generation. Um, and uh, Bubbles was commissioned by John Ingham, the journalist who oh, was right, managing. Yeah, of course. Generation X with uh, Stuart Joseph. And uh, John was quite interested in constructiv constructivism as well, early 20th century art. And this is a quote of several different artists. Um, and when Peter Savile and Malcolm Garrett saw the single, and he says in the book, they saw the single that it for sale in Piccadilly, in Virgin Piccadilly or whatever, and said, we now have a way. Bonnie Bubbles has shown us the way. We can look at the whole of the history of arts and visual culture and just use it um, to our own ends. And so he, he also said that Bubbles' practice is really sums up postmodernism as the past, the present and the possible. Right. And that sounds slightly pretentious, but I think there's a lot of worth in that. And this is what Bubbles was doing. He was throwing down the gauntlet to young designers and they picked it up. So there's, o there's obviously still a lot of interest in him by, you know, as we can see from the fact you've got your book republished, expanded right. edition and so forth, yeah. you know. Well, they're, they're, you know they're, go on. Turn. There's, um, ever since the start of the, the project, really, in 2008, I've been contacted a lot and got a great response from young designers and design followers. And, of course, we're all design heads now anyway, aren't we? It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not a a little pursuit everyone knows about mid-century modern furniture or yeah. japanese ceramics or whatever and this is one field which seems to really uh engage a certain type of younger person and so um the bonnie bubbles instagram thing just adds people all the time i get contacted by young designers and you know some pretty strong and powerful um big designers as well just wanting to see more and more of his work so it's great that he lives on. There's always been a sort of evangelistic side to this because when I started, barely anyone had heard of him. Right. So what's your favourite piece of Barney, personal favourite piece of Barney Bubbles' work? There's one of them, which is quite funny, but I'll show you this. You oh, see, that's, that's the Roundhouse poster, isn't it? That's the Roundhouse poster. Yeah, it's lovely. There. Um, and this is a printer's copy because we're going to do some posters we have a shot. We're going to do some post uh, reproductions of that. But that was such a great day, and it was such a. It was really life changing. Really, it was the first time I had mint tea and egg quiche. <laughs> oh, they that does that to turn any young boy's head. <laughs> exactly. Not not standing next to Lemmy's base bin. Were you too. wearing an army surplus greatcoat? <laughs> I may well have been, Mark. Did you was see there a me? tang? Was there a tang of patchouli oil in the air? You couldn't <laughs> no, go in the no roundhouse without a, an army yeah. surplus parade coat. <laughs> yes, it wasn't allowed, was it? There was probably yeah. a packet of Dunhills and also some herbal cigarettes from my <laughs> South African friend. But um, it was really a great day. Um, and it was great because, you know, I was 15. There was just a bunch of kids going absolutely crazy to Hawkwind with Stacia dancing and yeah. uh, Lemmy bass. They were supported by the Pink Fairies. But it's also a really great piece of design, I think. It's great. It it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Well, Paul, it's been fantastic talking to you. There's the book, The Wild it's, World of Barney Bowles. There's the, there's the design and the art of music.
Right. There's the T-shirt. <laughs> there are no <laughs> shortage of way on on message here. <laughs> no, that that particular thing ended up on a Nick Lowe cover, didn't it? There was a, it did. Yes, it did. Um, was it for, Breaking Glass? What was? It? I love the sound of Breaking Glass. It was. And, I love the sound of Breaking. And glass. the back of the book is the back of the uh, single as well. Of there course, go. of course. It's very beautifully done as well. Um, very it's a fantastic book. Produced. Really, really enjoyable. Magic. So much ephemera and so much stuff you've painstakingly collected. Very.